This is episode number one with New York Times bestselling author Lisa Genova. Welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hey there, it's Michelle. I have a very special guest today, and I'm so excited to share this conversation with you. Lisa Genova is the New York Times bestselling author of Still Alice and four other bestselling fiction books. Her book, Still Alice, was adapted into a major motion picture starring Julianne Moore and Alec Baldwin and actually won Julianne Moore the Best Actress Oscar in 2015. Lisa has been acclaimed as the Oliver Sacks of fiction and the Michael Crichton of brain science. Lisa has appeared on Dr. Oz, The Today Show, CNN, PBS, NewsHour, and NPR, and her TED Talk, What You Can Do to Prevent Alzheimer's, has been viewed over three million times. With her Ph.D. in neuroscience from Harvard University, Lisa made a life change that took her off of the conventional path. In today's episode, we dive deep into her story. She discusses how her grandmother's battle with Alzheimer's impacted her decision to become a fiction writer and how she went from self-publishing to becoming a New York Times bestseller and then seeing her book on the big screen. We also go into the importance of having empathy for those with neurological disorders. And we discuss how purpose is so important for all of us in our lives. And Lisa shares the questions that we can ask ourselves on our own journey. So let's get into the interview. Hey, Lisa, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on today. Oh my goodness, thank you. I'm so excited to do this. So you are such an inspiration to me. The more I learn about you and your work, the more admiration I have and the more excited I am to be having this conversation. I mean, I think people are very aware of your book, Still Alice, and the movie. They maybe have seen it or definitely have heard of it. But today I want people to know about you, about Lisa Genova, because your work is so heartfelt and meaningful and unique in terms of what you're doing. And so I thought it would be so great if we could just start by having you tell us, how does someone go from being a Harvard-trained PhD in neuroscience to a fiction writer? How did that happen? Oh my gosh. Well, it, it definitely wasn't planned. I, for most of my young adult life, I was very driven and linear and knew that I wanted to be a neuroscientist. And so that is exactly what I did. Um, I went from Bates College, where I majored in biopsychology, which is the equivalent of neuroscience today. They didn't have a neuroscience major undergrad back then. I worked in a lab at Mass General Hospital studying drug addiction for a year and then went on to a PhD program in Harvard. Um, And then I I did research at Harvard, the NIH, and uh, back at Mass General. Um, So that was my neuroscience life. And I actually didn't study Alzheimer's in all those years. My primary focus was on the molecular neurobiology of drug addiction. My interest in Alzheimer's which then caused me to change my life entirely. I started when my grandmother was diagnosed with it. So she was in her 80s when we realized she had Alzheimer's. She'd probably been dealing with symptoms of the disease in her, since her 70s, so probably for a good decade. Um, I think that our family was like a lot of families and that we assumed that her forgetting was a normal sign of normal aging and that Nana was just getting old. And I think we were also in denial because no one wants Alzheimer's to happen to someone you love. So by the time things got bad enough for us to realize that this is actually Alzheimer's, she was pretty far along into the disease. Um, And so I'm the neuroscientist in the family. So I did what I could. I read everything I could find about Alzheimer's. I really did my homework to understand the neuroscience and the clinical treatment and how to manage and and be a caregiver. 
And while all of that was really important education or fascinating education to the neuroscientist in me, it really left me with little to understand how to be with my grandmother as her granddaughter. So I think the key piece of information that was missing for me in all of that education about Alzheimer's was what does it feel like to have this? And so unfortunately, I couldn't sit down with my grandmother and have that conversation with her because she was too far along into the disease by the time we realized she really had this. And so I was really unable to get to a place of empathy with her. I could feel for her and for us. That That's really sympathy. There's there's a big distinction between sympathy and empathy. And empathy is really the key. It was what I needed to stay connected to her. And I just, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to get to being with my grandmother from a place of empathy. And, and so I remember thinking at the time that, well, you know, all of these books I'm reading are all books written by scientists, clinicians, caregivers, social workers, None of them were by a person living with the disease. Um, There are many out actually now that are pretty wonderful. There's one in particular called On Pluto by Greg O'Brien. But back then, this was in the late 90s, um, early 2000s, there really wasn't that perspective. And, And I also knew that fiction was a place where we can have the chance to walk in someone else's shoes. Fiction is a place where we can explore empathy. And in fact, there are neuroimaging studies that show that the parts of our brain that light up when we're reading fiction are the parts of the brain involved in empathy. And people who read fiction score higher on empathy tests than than people who read other kinds of text. So I had this sort of aha connected moment where I thought, well, fiction is a place where I could maybe find the answer to this question of what does it feel like to have Alzheimer's? But that book didn't exist. And so the next step was like, well, what if I wrote it? And so that's how I made the leap. And it was it was a very scary thing to do in retrospect. I was, at the time, I was recently divorced. So my daughter had just turned four. And the man who I had been with in college and all the way up until my um, early 30s, so I was 33, um, the marriage fell apart uh, shortly after my daughter was born and you know, tried to stay together and couldn't really imagine my life without him. Um, so I was suddenly divorced and I was unemployed. I'd quit my job when my daughter was born. At the time, I was a strategy consultant for biotech and pharmaceutical companies and I was working like 60 to 70 hours a week and traveling. And so I quit intending to take a year off. Um, but then when the marriage started to fall apart, I... I didn't do anything because I wasn't quite sure what to do. And then so here I was, 33, divorced, unemployed, single mom, should really go back to work. But in that moment, that sort of life moment, um, where everything seemed to be uncertain, and that was really scary to me because I had always known exactly what my life was going to look like next. And all of a sudden, I really couldn't picture what my future was going to hold for me. And at first that was terrifying, but luckily it turned into a curiosity and I got really curious about like, well, what could my future look like next? And then, well, if I could create anything I wanted, what would that look like? And then it was, if I could create anything I wanted and if I didn't have to worry about what anyone thought of me, that was really the thing that gave me the freedom to give my real answer, the real truth, the sort of soul truth, which was, I want to try to write that novel. Um, now, this was now two years after my Nana had passed away. So I wasn't giving myself permission to write that book with that great idea because I wasn't a writer. I was a neuroscientist. But now I, I, I sort of felt like I was in this in-between moment in life where I could kind of choose anything if I wanted to, if I dared to. So that's how I made the transition. I literally said, okay, I'm not going back to work, dropping my daughter off at preschool, and I'm going to the Starbucks near my house, and I'm going to start writing this book about a woman with Alzheimer's. That is so courageous. I mean, I think a lot of women have these thoughts of wanting to do something like what you're doing, but it takes a lot of courage. What was the, I don't know, what was like the main mindset or impetus that allowed you to just take that risk, though, versus falling back? Because we can always have those voices in our head that says, 
what are you doing? Why are you sitting here at Starbucks? You should be getting a job and making income. This isn't practical. So how do you move past that? Oh, totally. It was so unreasonable. Um, it was so impractical. It was so, it would have been so wonderful to be at a job I knew I was good at that I would get paid for that I'd have health insurance for. Um, so a couple of things, I think that because I don't think I would have quit my job to write a novel. I think that I had, because I had already taken myself out of the workspace for what I imagined was a very temporary time. I had some space to dream up what else might be possible. And then when I made the decision to do, to do it and I made that leap, I was definitely plagued with a lot of doubt at times, which was, sounded like, who am I to do this? And this is nuts. This is so uncertain. This feels so risky. There's no guarantee that when I finish this, because it's a marathon, not a sprint, you can't write a novel, you know, in a week. It, it, for me, it takes about a year to a year and a half. And, um, so it's going to take a while. I have no idea if it's going to be any good when I'm done. No guarantee that I'll ever get paid. So, you know, I was used to feedback and accolades and respect and, and colleagues and none of that now existed. So one of the things that kept me going, especially when I would think, who am I to do this? I would go into libraries and bookstores and look at the thousands of books in front of me and think, well, all of these people did it, Lisa. Why can't you? So I, I love that. Yeah. I have to just stop right just for a second. That's <laughs> cool. So you were you were allowing those voices that were being the naysayers, but then you kept encouraging and looking for reasons why you should just keep continuing to trust that voice. Is that right? Yeah, and it wasn't so much I was allowing. I think that the negative self talk is something that we all wrestle with. Um I I practice yoga and I know that yoga has saved me a lot in this process. There's, there's this thing, right? I mean, all of us writers go through these moments where you're staring at the cursor, the blinking cursor or the blank screen or the blank page. And the impulse is very fight or flight. It's, Oh my God, I got to get out of this. I feel really uncomfortable right now. There's so much fear. And cause I don't know what happens next. And what if it sucks? So the impulse is to get up, to run away, to go like see what's in the refrigerator or call someone or do the laundry or, you know, I have three kids. So there's a million things I could be doing other than staring my fear down. But yoga teaches you to stay in the pose, to breathe, to create space before you react and realize that you can just sit, be still and breathe and that, that it will pass. And so I think that the yoga helps me a lot too, to just stay in the seat and not abandon and get the words down. I love that so much. Um, I think we all need that, you know, in our lives and, um, it can be hard to do because those negative voices, like you said, are always there. Um, so the discipline piece or the, the mental focus was there, but you hadn't taken any writing classes, right? So was there, how how did you, know that you could actually write fiction? Well, I didn't know. And interestingly, I think I didn't know what I didn't know. And that was actually kind of helpful. That naivete kept me from, I didn't know any writers at the time. And I didn't know how difficult and sort of pessimistic that crowd can be because it is hard to get published. It is hard to make a career as a writer. And I think that If I had known a lot of writers, I might have been talked out of trying this. I also might have been influenced into writing a different version of my book because I might have thought, you know, if others, if I were belong to a writer's group or if I had been, you know, submitting it to various editors, they might have had different ideas as to what the book should be. And I would have thought, well, they know better than I do because they're real writers. So I didn't know anyone. I didn't know what I was doing. I did read books on writing craft. So, you know, I'm I'm sort of, I see myself as a lifelong student and I love to learn. So I wasn't afraid of, I didn't just do it blindly. So I read Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg, um, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, On Writing by Stephen King, um, uh, The Sound of Paper by Julia Cameron and The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. So I, yeah, just that's an amazing book, just sort of on being creative in any endeavor. 
And so I felt I was writing, I was reading some books on this, I guess the spirituality of creating and books on writing craft. And I was excited. I was learning new information. And interestingly, so I never took a writing class, but so while I'm being this sort of unreasonable, wildly irresponsible (laughs) neuroscientist who's writing a novel in Starbucks, I figured, well, you know, everybody thinks I've gone nuts. So I'm just going to keep going. I had always wanted to learn how to act. And neuroscientists don't typically hang out with the drama kids. <laughs> so I now I figured, well, I, I can do this because nobody has any expectations of me anymore. So I, I ended up training with a group of 11 other actors in Boston for the year and a half that I was writing Still Alice. Amazing. And thank you. And right, I, what I, acting was such a gift in that it, it, all of the lessons in acting, I think, applied beautifully to writing. So I learned about, you know, how to raise the stakes as high as possible whenever possible, that you're always telling the truth under the imagined circumstances. Uh, how are people changed by what happens? Because that's the only thing that's interesting. Um, so, you know, all of these, you know, exercises and script analysis and, and acting, all of these exercises I did um, really helped me then go home and sort of be emotionally honest on the page. Um, it's so cool. Now you're obviously the neuroscientist and I'm not. Um, but so acting, is that more right brain activity? Cause your books are really a mix in a sense, right? There's the fiction creative piece and then there's the hard science. Like you study all of these neuro neurological disorders, um, so that you can represent them accurately and, allow people to really understand what people are going through. Is that, is that, am I saying that correctly? Is that right? Oh yeah. So I feel an enormous responsibility to get the information right. Um, both because I know people who know, so if I'm writing about whether it's Alzheimer's or autism or brain injury, Huntington's, ALS, like people who have no connection to Alzheimer's and have, don't know anyone with it. If they're reading my book, this is their chance at a real education about what what does a person actually go through when they're diagnosed and how does the disease progress and how do people react and how do you cope? Um, and so that's my chance to educate folks who don't know anything about it. And then for the folks who are living with this, I really feel a responsibility to those people and their families to get the information right and to portray these experiences with dignity, accuracy, respect, Um, So, yeah, I do my homework. I read the medical textbooks, the scientific literature. I shadow neurologists. I sit in on neuropsych testing and I interview genetic counselors and general practice docs and get to know people and families living with these diseases and disorders. Um, So that's, you know, real, you know, research. And then I have to take that leap into fiction. It's not unlike authors who write historical fiction, right? So if uh, like I, you know, not long ago read All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, and that takes place during World War II. And he did a ton of research, which he'd have to, about that time period in France and Germany and, you know, what did people eat and how did they live and, and what was going on there. And, and, and then World War II and to layer that on and what actually happened. And then once you have all that information, once you know that truth, then you create the characters in the story. And so, yeah, whether it's left brain or right brain, I mean, the, there are um, asymmetries and distinctions in our brains that have led to this sort of generalized layman's notion that like the left does one thing and the right does another. Um, and there are some specialization there, but there's so much crosstalk that we generally have a very integrated left and right. Um, that's super helpful. And I guess as you're talking, it's making me curious about the actual creative pro- process because you're spending all this time with the neuroscientists, learning, researching, and doing all that. But at the same time, you're also writing fiction and creating characters. So can you take us into your creative process? Do you know in advance what the storyline is going to be? Or do you start getting into the science and then start developing the characters? Or is it sort of a combination? Yeah. So I don't outline my books. I begin with, so with each one, it's, there are decisions that I make early on and I follow the story from there. And I I sort of try to stay in the sensory moment to moment details as I follow what would happen if. So for example, with Still Alice, I know I'm going to write about Alzheimer's. 
the first decision I make is, well, I'm going to give this to someone young. So the main character is going to be a woman because that was based on my grandmother or in, inspired by her. And I wanted to make her young because the people who were raising their hands and saying, I'm, I'll talk to you, I'll, I'll tell you anything you want to know about what it's like to live with Alzheimer's, people who have it, they were in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. So these were folks who either had early onset Alzheimer's or who were still in the early stages of Alzheimer's and could communicate what it feels like to live with it. And in getting to know these folks, and I was in touch with people every day, I was in touch with tw- a co- some combination of 27 people every day for the year and a half that I was writing this book. And so we were on, in touch through an email group or a, a one hour live chat every day or through phone. Um, and I recognized that, that these people aren't included in what gets talked about when we talk about Alzheimer's. I think the general public's notion of this disease and part of the reason I think that we've ignored it for so long is like, well, this is just a disease of the dying elderly. And, you know, unfortunately that's a, a, a population that we maybe aren't con- taking the time to consider and give our care and attention to. Um, but what about, uh, and they, and those folks obviously do deserve our care and attention. And what about all the people who are living with Alzheimer's? What about people who are in their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies? Like we're not really used to thinking about people living with this disease. So I kind of wanted to to shake things up and, again, still portraying the truth. But what happens if a 50-year-old woman gets this? And here's a disease that robs you of your memory, language, and cognition. Well, what if you have placed all of your worth and identity in being able to be someone who is an intellectual, who relies on memory, language, and cognition for your very sense of worth and identity? So I thought, well, I'll make Alice. Uh, a Harvard professor. I thought that was genius, I have to say. Uh, I really did, because just like you're saying, you're bringing attention to an issue to create empathy. And you're right. I think sometimes people think, oh, well, oh, an 85-year-old, they have they got to live their life. But she's she she's just in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, and so I really want to bring attention to that. And so the story, the process involves, like, so I make these big decisions up front, So like, for example, with Every Note Played, which is my newest novel about, it's a concert pianist with ALS. And so ALS is a degenerative motor neuron disease where you become progressively paralyzed. And so again, it's like, well, what would happen if I were a concert pianist and all of my worth and identity and passion involves my ability to play piano, to move my hands, and then I'm no longer able to do that. And so... There are sort of big universal human themes that always come up. It's kind of amazing that sort of studying people with neurological conditions always reveals some life lesson about our human condition, which we all share. So like with Alzheimer's, there's the idea that you are more than what you can remember, that if I forget this conversation you and I are having five minutes after we're done, it doesn't mean that we didn't enjoy the conversation while we were having it or that it didn't matter. So this idea that you matter beyond what you can remember. Um, the There's, uh, you know, with autism, that book was all about unconditional love um, and that, you know, we tend to view people on the autism spectrum as, as different and other. And my biggest aha in writing that story is that, oh, we're all on the spectrum. <laughs> And once you see, once you understand that, it invites the possibility that we're really all connected. Um, so the, all of the books have sort of these, you know, big life themes of redemption or forgiveness or unconditional love or worthiness. And then just getting the words down, like what's the process like? Yeah. So I have three kids and, um, I have to get out of my house because if I'm home, (laughs) I will, I will daydream out the window. Mm -hmm. I will take a nap. I will see what's in the fridge. I will be on Facebook or Instagram or whatever email too long. I'll do laundry. 
So I, I still like to write in a coffee shop. I'll go to Starbucks That's and great. because I, you can't daydream or take a nap or do anything that for too long without looking stupid. So <laughs> I, um, and I don't even do it's, I'm on Cape Cod and it's so funny that the Starbucks near my house, like up until a couple of years ago, didn't even have Wi-Fi. Wow. So yeah, it's like the 1970s oh, here. Oh my goodness. So, so, but which was great because then it's like, okay, I'm going to drop the kids off at school I'm going to go to Starbucks and I'm going to sit my butt down for about four hours and I'm going to try to get a thousand to fifteen hundred words down. And the idea is, you know, get the words down. You mm. can't edit nothing and you have to move the story forward. And so the day always begins with fear. And I usually begin, um, I borrowed this from Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. She calls it morning pages. But it's, I begin pen to paper and I write down stream of consciousness for about three pages. And it usually begins with, so say I'm on chapter three. What happens next? I have no idea. Okay, don't freak out. But like I'll, I'll sort of pep talk my way into like, it's okay that you're nervous and anxious and worried. And the only way out of that feeling is through it. So you have to write something and it's going to, it's going to be fine. You're going to find it. And so usually then I'll start writing a little, I'll I'll maybe dump any other anxiety I'm feeling onto the page. And then I start like, well, what if she said this? And what if he did that? And da, 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 da. I usually find my way in, um, on pen to paper. And then I switch over to the laptop and I just go and I don't, you know, I don't critique as I'm writing. I don't edit as I'm writing because that's a very different process. Creating is sort of allowing it to come through you. So I like Elizabeth Gilbert has this amazing Ted talk. So she wrote eat, pray, love. Yes. And she talks about how, how the idea that these stories feel like oftentimes they come through her and not from her. Yes. And and I so identify with that feeling that there's a a surrender and an allowing that you've, okay, I've done all my homework. I've done all this research. I, I understand so much. And now I just need to get really present and, and allow the story to come through me. Yeah. I can relate to that completely too. And, um, I think that it's so beautiful the way that you stay true to your craft and sit there and move through it and do it. I think that a lot of people are actually going to take away ways to manage their own creative process, because I think sometimes just like you learn from reading Elizabeth Gilbert or or other people, you learn ways to manage the process because there needs to be some discipline around how you do it. And speaking of that, I guess I'm curious because I think I'm not sure people know this, but you originally self-published your book and it was rejected by almost 100 agents. And you sold your book out of the back of a car for, I don't know, was it just under a year? You can let me know in a second. But my question is, how did you keep motivated once that book was done and, you know, you wanted it to be published by an agent and they weren't understanding your vision for it? How did you keep that motivation going? So, yeah, I finished, I finished Still Alice and I did what you're supposed to do next. I sent her out query letters that I got the literary marketplace guide and I found a hundred literary agents who according to the book would be interested in possibly interested in the kind of book I'd written. So I sent out the query letters. It's, you know, it's quite possible that my query letter just completely sucked, but I, um, I I heard back. I doubt that Lisa. (laughs) I doubt it. (laughs) I I heard back. No. in in the form letter, the sort of dear author, thanks for your submission, but no thanks. So I heard back. No, from most of them within the first few months, And while that was all very disappointing, it wasn't really yet discouraging because none of them had read the manuscript. So they hadn't read the work itself. No, it was just the query letter they were rejecting. They were rejecting the idea of it because, you know, it's like, and I kind of don't blame them. It's like, okay, a neuroscientist has written a novel. That sounds sketchy. (laughs) And then, and then it's about a woman with Alzheimer's and, you know, I, I bumped up against this over and over. So eventually three agents wanted to read the book. I'm still waiting to hear back from one. Oh my goodness. Um, (laughs) That person's kicking themselves right now though. I know. I always, I love to tell people it's like that scene from pretty woman when Julia Roberts goes back to the store where they (laughs) wait on her and she says, you work on commission, right? (laughs) Um, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So the other two said, you know, 
oh, okay, like I like the book, but it's just too risky. Like fiction is a very tricky, risky market. And you've written about a woman with Alzheimer's. And I think that the general public's just too afraid of this disease or it's a little too depressing. I just don't think people are going to want to read a book about a woman with Alzheimer's. And interestingly, fast forward many years later when I had a film agent, um, he said a similar thing. Um, Hallmark and Lifetime were interested in it and I refused to even entertain the possibility of selling the film rights to them because I wanted it to go to the big screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and not just because like I wanted to go to the Oscars someday with Julianne Moore. It was you know, if my mission is to help drag Alzheimer's out of the closet and into a global conversation where we can talk about this disease that is scary and overwhelming and, and get people to, to sort of humanize it. And then we can invite sort of the conversations that lead to social change and a sense of urgency that's going to lead to more funding and advancements in medicine for Alzheimer's. So I want to do that in a big way. And I was worried that, you know, selling it to Hallmark probably wasn't going to expand my audience much. And so my film agent said, Lisa, you've got a drama starring a 50-year-old woman with Alzheimer's. Hollywood is never going to make that movie. Wow. So so backing up to the book again, like, so that's what I was hearing. Like, these two agents um, that read the manuscript said, okay, but, yeah, I don't think it's marketable. So I was really left with the choice of, like nobody wanted it. So it was stick the book in the drawer and go back to being a neuroscientist or a strategy consultant, or I could self publish it. And I really didn't want to self publish it because I come from the world of science where you can't publish anything unless it's peer reviewed. Right. And, and so to, in essence, I was about to publish it without being peer reviewed. And so it just, I, I was definitely worried about the stigma that would be attached to it. And the reason I had the couple of reasons I had confidence. One was some of my closest friends and family who I knew would not BS me said that the book was amazing and I should go for it. And the other was I'd seen examples of this, you know, this was back in 2007. So Facebook had just started, um, self-publishing for books really wasn't a mainstream thing yet. Right. But it, but it was for filmmakers mm. and it was for musicians. So we'd seen these other creative areas where, you know, you don't have to wait for a record deal, deal from Columbia to build an audience, put out your record on your own, or you could be an indie filmmaker. So I thought that maybe there was a chance that there was room for this in the, the book publishing space. So yeah, in the summer of 2007, I self-published Still Alice with iUniverse. I spent $450 um, getting them to publish the book. And then I could buy copies, I think like 50% off. And so I sold them out of the trunk of my car um, here on Cape Cod. And the independent bookstores would carry like two or three copies on consignment. Uh, Barnes and Noble and Target and Borders at the time would not carry them if the major chains wouldn't look at it. I could list it at Amazon, so that was super helpful. And um, I I marketed it online through social media that existed at the time, which was mostly MySpace and author's den. Thank God. I love it. Yeah. So far. Yeah. Like yeah. it's like ancient history at this point. Sure. So I was giving myself a year and, and I, the, I was giving myself a year to get to a big publishing house because I wasn't going to make a living as a self-published writer, at least at the time. And, um, I found my way to a literary agent and Simon Schuster in 10 months. So Thank goodness Simon Schuster bought the rights and got me out of the trunk of my car. (laughs) Right. But that's it's an amazing story, actually. And I admire your persistence with it, because like you said, this book came through you. You were just needing to get it out in the world and you stayed true to that and you didn't give up. So um, I applaud you for that. And what's amazing is then the world resonated with the book, didn't they? So it spent 59 weeks 
on the New York Times bestsellers list, which is phenomenal. So trusting that inner voice of yours allowed like all these people to connect to this character of Alice and find empathy for people with Alzheimer's, which is what your mission was. So congratulations on all of that. I mean, I think it's such a great story on so many levels, but then it gets better. So how does it go from book now, you're talking about film, right? So you were entertained by um, not the major motion picture houses. So how did it end up becoming a major motion picture? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so this was the next level of like, oh, my God, who knew this could happen? So, so right. So it, you know, it, it bumped around a little. So Hallmark and Lifetime wanted it, but I said no. And then we had a, another director who was, a big director who was potentially interested and he shopped it around to a few actresses first, but nobody bought, nobody bit. And then this, this producer from England, um, his name is James Brown and his business partner, Lex lets us, they made exactly one film together called age of heroes about a world war two movie aimed at teenage boys. Um, he calls me out of the blue and says, gives me the story of how he came to know about Still Alice and that this is their dream movie. This is what they want to make. Wow. And he really understands the book. And we just, we get, we clicked. And it was another moment of this sort of, it was an intuitive, this is the way. And it was sort of unreasonable because he did not have the resume to give me any reason to believe that he could actually make this movie in a big way. Um, and yet, you know, I, I, I recognized in him what, where I was in my career as well as like, I didn't have the resume to write still Alice. Um, but he, everything he said just clicked with me and we, you know, we, to this day, James is like a brother to me. So I said yes to this unknown producer from London. And so he bought the film rights. And then they signed on the directors, uh, Richard Glasser and Wash West Westmoreland, also not very well known directors. They'd really done only one film that was known called Quinceanera, um, which did very well at Sundance, but didn't really do much beyond that. Um, and then interestingly, so I was in Australia just before selling the film rights to them. And I was on book tour for um, Left Neglected, my second book. And in my little notebook where I was writing down cute little Australian sayings in case I ever create a character from Australia, on one page all by itself, I wrote Julianne Moore for Still Alice. Wow. Just out of the blue, it came to you? like you Yeah. Just had, wow. Uh, yeah, I still have it. I've actually taken a picture of that page in my journal and sent it to her and That's let her know so that I, cool. I manifested her. Um, yeah, so we're in that fast forward. After you manifested that, Lisa. Yeah, I know. So like three months after that trip to Australia, I'm in London also promoting Left Neglected, but now I have a chance to meet James and Lex in person and we're all excited to make this movie and, you know, we're having dinner and, and martinis and we're all warm and fuzzy and like, okay, who do you want to be? who do you want to play Alice if you could have anyone? I said, Julianne Moore. And they said, oh my God, we want her too. Oh my goodness. It happened. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And it's crazy that movies ever get made is my take home message from that experience. Like the number, like I can just sit down and write a book and it's all in my control. Filmmakers. Oh my God. They have actors schedules and budget that may or may not come in and all of the, the makeup and the sound and the cinematographer and like all of these people that need to come together in the same time, the same place and bring their best selves and their most talented selves to this singular vision that it ever happens amazes me. Um, okay. So let's go the next step. So not only did the movie get made, but Julianne Moore won an Oscar for a role of a character you wrote. Like, how did that feel? And you must have some fun story to share about that experience. Yeah, I mean, it was completely it was completely mind blowing. So I got to be on the set, and the first day I get there, they're filming the scene in the house where it's it's the Christmas Eve dinner. And so Alec Baldwin's at the head of the table. Julia Moore's at the other head of the table. And we've got Kate Bosworth and Kristen Stewart and Hunter Parrish. 
and Wash, one of the directors, walks me in the room to meet everyone. And I said, oh, my God, I made all of you up. And here you are. <laughs> it's so trippy. Um, it must have been surreal on some level, just like you're seeing what you wrote come to life. Like, that's incredible. Yeah, it was. Yes. And they were very true to the book. So there's definitely some differences. And it was fascinating to watch the choices that they needed to make at times and and scenes that they shot that got edited out for all kinds of reasons. And, and the scene in the, the chapter in the book that James read that made him know for sure he wanted to make this into a movie never even made it into the first draft of the wow. script. So like there are, you know, so much of the book is in the film and then a lot of it of course isn't. And it, yeah. So the whole thing I thought was just fascinating and such just, yeah, like such an honor that, that they would then take what I wrote and make it this visual cinematic experience. And so we, they shot the film in March of 2014. It was just a five week shoot. So it was super fast. And, um, they edited it in lightning speed and it was done and premiered just a few months later in September at the Toronto international film festival. And I hadn't seen it yet. Like they literally finished editing it about two weeks prior to when it premiered. And, um, I had no, I, you know, don't know what to expect. Like I'm not knowing whether I'm going to be telling my families and family and friends, okay, it's a train wreck. Don't see it. Let's pretend this never happened. Um, you know, we'll just move on with our lives or, Oh my God, I'm so proud of this. The whole world is going to see this movie. And thank God it was the second thing. So as soon as it premiered in Toronto, the buzz was the reviews and the buzz were totally lit up and it was immediately clear that she was going to be in a race for Oscars. So I got to travel with the cast and, and crew quite a bit to go to different film festivals um, I got to go to the Oscars, which was, you know, again, mind blowing and unbelievable. And, and that morning I was in Starbucks to, um, get a tea and I'm in line and I'm, you know, I'm in Hollywood and I'm getting ready to go walk the red carpet with Julianne Moore. And I, I just started crying and I'm like, I just Aww. started, you know, I could hear my Nana's laugh. I could hear her just so tickled by all of this that like this started with my grandmother's Alzheimer's. It's just a wild, wild ride. It's yeah. beautiful. I mean, just a, it's a beautiful story. And also it's like, let's just pause there. So had you gone back to strategy consulting or, you know, didn't take the step and then just took take the next right step and none of that would have manifested? I'm sure other beautiful things in your life would have, but this was in you to come out. And I, I just, I'm just so inspired by all of it. I think it's so amazing. Um... And it's interesting because actually every note played, the reason that you chose ALS has something to do with the movie. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, but just to back up just for one Please. second, yeah. I know I get, I get goosebumps whenever I think about the shift. It's, I think about that movie sliding doors with Gwyneth Paltrow. Yes. So you, you make these choices in life and you know, I think that if I had gone back to strategy consulting or if I'd gone back to research as a neuroscientist, I would have loved my job. I, I enjoyed everything I had done up until becoming a novelist. But interestingly, I don't just love what I do. I feel an amazing sense of purpose with what I do. I have like a, a very solid knowing that I am doing what I'm supposed to do. Like this is my soul's work. And I believe that. Whereas before I, I loved my job and it was, you know, I liked the people. I liked the job. I made a good living. It all worked. But what I do now lights me up and I feel fueled and driven to contribute something meaningful and important and healing um, to the world. And in, in, a, in the way that I feel like only I can do. So it's just, it feels really, um, I feel very connected to why I'm here. And I didn't have that before doing this. Um, can we actually, so let's stay on this a bit, because actually the reason for this podcast and to highlight and feature amazing women like you that are moms too, just doing these incredible things, is to remind people of the preciousness of life and what's possible and that there are these voices inside that are whispering and saying, 
hey, I'm still here and I'm, I'm whispering to you, pay attention. You know, I yeah. have, I want to come out into this world and you are the only person who can bring this true expression of what you're meant to do. Like I write in my book, life is about remembering. And I do feel like we're here to remember who we are on a soul level and to be the fullest expression of ourselves. But it's hard to do that sometimes. Um, and I want to get into the every note played. But since we're on this, um, one of the questions I did want to ask you is because you gave a beautiful talk. If you could do anything you wanted, um, you encourage in this talk the audience to ask themselves what they would do if they could do anything they wanted. And do you think this is a question that all women should be asking themselves? I do. I think it's a question for all human beings to ask themselves. I think that, you know, we don't, whether you get to live to be 40 or 80, it's going to go by in a snap. So this is it, folks. Like, you're you're riding around in this container for just a little while before we're gone. So, and interestingly, like that book I just wrote, Every Note Played in ALS is really a, about facing your mortality and your death. And, and we don't like to think about that. We think we're going to be here forever, but you're not. And so what is it that you're here to do? Who are you here to be? Um, and, and, it's a, and to ask those questions and then, to listen to the small voice that might get louder in different ways as the universe sort of tries to give you the opportunity to wake up to what you're he here to do. Um, and it's interesting. I think, I feel like everything is a duality too. I love, I, my oldest just um, went off to Georgetown her first year and she has grown up with me saying to her, like she'll come to me about, you know, big important issues of like, what is she going to do and what's her purpose and, and, what does she want to do with this life she's been given? And we'll talk about how, you know, she's unique on this planet and in the history of people, there's only been her and she has unique gifts and unique, a unique brain and, and she's going to be extraordinary in whatever she does. And then I'll, and then I'll always follow that up with, and you're a speck on a rock spinning around a ball of fire, <laughs> hurtling through infinite space. <laughs> right. And don't forget that. Right. So it's like, it's like, it, there's an urgency and a pressure to this, like, oh my God, you matter. And what's your purpose? But like, don't let that bind you up with fear and angst. It's like, eh, and you're going to be here and gone in a minute. So it's like, it has both, it has that duality. I think that, you know, you take it seriously, but hold it lightly. hundred um, percent. I think we share yeah. a similar um, life view. I mean, you end that talk with, do what you want to do, do what you love. This is why you are here. And I think, I'm wondering if there's something tangible, because I think there are many people, people out there going to be listening and go, yes, I've been hearing that whisper, but how do I start? How do I know? Because I think a lot of times people are worried they're going to take the wrong step, right? It's Maybe that's not right. Maybe this is my ego. So uh, can you give any advice on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I think that a lot like to figure out the doubt, where is that coming from? Because we do have responsibilities and we do have, you know, like we have people to take care of or bills to pay. And I'm not saying that like, listen to, you know, recklessness driven by ego. But if, if you have this voice that's telling you that you really want to do something or be something, and then the, it's followed by, yeah, but or you should, or you shouldn't, or you can't because, and those reasons are driven by fear. If when you boil it all down, if the reason you're not pursuing what you really would love to do is based in fear, then, then that's probably something to pay attention to. Like that's probably your, your, your ego is probably trying to keep you safe and comfortable um, I think that decisions made out of fear are probably never the right path that if you could maybe bust through that fear and say, well, what if I tried it and maybe make it, you know, so that it's not so life and death. Well, what if I tried it for, you know, X amount of time, or what if I took a class or what if I saved up a little money and allowed myself to travel here to start whatever, um, you know, you don't have to do it all at once. And we sort of like, I take that approach even in writing every book. It's like, oh my God, I have to write a 300 page novel. Oh, I just want to like curl up in the fetal position. But if I think, well, I'm just going to write four pages today. Well, I can manage that. 
So if your whatever your dream is, if it feels overwhelming or scary or you can't because of the enormity of it or the, the, the sheer terror of it all, could you chunk it down into something smaller where you could start and realize that, you know, maybe you can try and begin and give yourself some data or proof to see that, oh, yeah, this is my calling. This is what I'm here to do. I, that's amazing. And I completely agree with everything you've said. And I'm just wondering more about your process, too, because, you know, you mentioned you went to the bookstore and saw these books and on the shelves that, you know, and said, hey, why not me, too? So in your own process of listening to that voice and you just kept taking the next right step, whatever was in front of you that made sense. Okay, I, I'm going to write it. And okay, I can't get a publisher, so I'll self-publish, but I still want to get the publisher. You just kept following it. Did you have a vision in your mind, though, of being a New York Times bestseller? Were you following sort of the 30,000 foot level view of, you know, manifesting what you desired and then took the steps? Or did you just let the process guide you to where you ended up? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And it's funny because I've always been a very driven person and, I, and I've always aimed for success. But it, success means different things. And the what I visualized and what I hoped for was that that a lot of people would read the book, that the book, that the book would resonate with the right people who needed it. And so like I approached the Alzheimer's Association early on and gave them the book and they loved it. And I got to blog for them and, and I sort of started becoming an advocate and a voice and a member of that community because I wanted what I had found in writing that story to help other people traveling that journey. So like, I so wish I knew then when my grandmother was alive, what I understand now. And I didn't know this. I didn't understand how to get to empathy while she was alive. I know this now. The book, the book is a, a vehicle and a guide for that now. And I want to pass that baton to as many people as I can. And so the idea was like, I really hope this book reaches all of the people who need it. And yeah, as a result of that, it would, you know, become it would become a New York Times bestseller. But that wasn't the I need to write a New York Times bestseller. I think that if that's the goal, that feels a little hollow in some ways. It's like I want it to to do all the things I hope the book does. And then as a result, all of this other stuff would follow. But I, I didn't really know. I didn't know how to dream this big for the book. I, I Again, I think I didn't know what I didn't know. So if I had stayed a neuroscientist, like maybe your goal is to win the Nobel Prize or maybe your goal is to get a tenure track position as a professor. Like I sort of knew what the achievements were as a scientist. But as a novelist, I, I didn't grow up there. I wasn't climbing the, the rungs of that ladder. So I, I kind of I came in sideways and asked backwards. <laughs> so <laughs> I just uh, – I was – my mission was to help people understand this disease from a space of empathy and everything else just followed from that. And it has given me the permission to continue doing what I do. So I'm thrilled that it's been on the New York Times bestseller list. And I'm thrilled that it was made into a movie. And it's not because I got to wear a beautiful dress and walk on the red carpet, although that was really, really fun. Um, it's because I get to do this thing that, that helps people understand p others who tend to be ignored, feared, misunderstood. And it's just these books become a bridge to um, bringing people back into community, connecting people through em empathy. That was the best answer because what I took from that and what I think and believe to be true in my heart is follow what is in your heart, what is your purpose. And that's just really what you did. It's, you do such a beautiful job. So your mission is not only to help people understand the neurological diseases and the impacts on these people, but then most importantly, to have empathy. Um, you know, let's go back to Every Note Played. That story made me cry. I'm not going to give anything away because I think everyone should read it. Um, but it's so beautifully written. And you, again, you have, you know, somebody who's super successful, a renowned pianist, and he has L ALS. Can you talk about how things are interconnected? So every note played was written as a result of your experience with somebody very significant to you um, from Still Alice. Can you talk about that? Yeah, thank you. 
Um, so Richard Glatzer, who co-wrote the script and co-directed the film, was diagnosed with ALS just a couple of months before he read Still Alice and had the amazing courage and and tenacity and generosity to say, I, you know, what do you want to do with the time you have left? The average life expectancy following an ALS diagnosis is three years. So, and he had bulbar ALS, which means that it began in the motor neurons that feed his head and neck. So he lost the ability to speak almost right away. So what do you want to do? Do you want to, you know, circle the wagons and spend time with family and friends? Do you want to sell the house and travel the world? Or do you want to make one more film? And that's what he decided to do. And so I got to know Richard quite well. And I witnessed his um, grace. Uh, Cause here you are, you're showing up probably the biggest film of his life and he's wearing a bib because he's drooling and he can't speak. And he, one arm is completely paralyzed and he's typing with one other finger on an iPad to give his direction to Alec Baldwin and Julianne Moore. And, you know, most of us like to show up for big, important things as our best selves and Richard's best self at the time was really compromised and that he was willing to do that just, I think, took, you know, courage and humility and grace. And so I asked, asked him, um, you know, ALS is certainly on my, was certainly on my list of diseases and disorders and conditions that I might write about. Because again, I'm, I'm trying to write about, um, as a neuroscientist, I'm fascinated with the brain. And I think my training makes me uniquely qualified to explore, um, conditions and diseases of the brain. And I'm also looking for folks who tend to be ignored, feared, and misunderstood. So people who live with shame and stigma and alienation because of what they have, um, you know, that's, if we can't, we might not be able to cure these diseases yet, but we can certainly do something about the loneliness or the exclusion. And so I think these stories become a vehicle for familiarity and understanding. And so ALS was absolutely on that list. Um, and so I asked Richard if I could write about that next. And he said, of course. And so he became the first person I knew who was in communication with me about what does it feel like to have this? Because again, like, okay, how many of you, did you dump a bucket of ice water over your head? Probably. I mean, I did. Did you do the ice bucket challenge? So we, we, we do this, we dump the bucket of ice water. And then what did we do next? We probably posted it to Facebook, you know, maybe, tagged a few people, maybe donated a little money, and then you had lunch and you did the next thing and you probably spent very little time considering anything more about ALS and what it feels like. So again, the book becomes an opportunity to not just learn what ALS is, to not learn, it's not just about learning. I think when we learn about anything, if we're just learning the definition or a list of symptoms or I don't know, like a bunch of bullet points, that's one way of learning information. But if we can add empathy as an ingredient to how we learn, it just shifts everything. And, and you, did de- you did it beautifully. So Lisa, I'm just really curious, um, you know, when you're writing about neurological disorders and getting into the science, and then you're meeting these people who are personally being impacted and then their families, how does it change the way that you live now? Oh, it- It definitely does. So I think that with every book I write, I become a better human being in some way. So because I learn again, it's I'm learning about these neurological conditions, but in the course of knowing the people who are willing to share with me what's going on in their lives. I mean, these are people who, so for example, with the story about ALS, I came to know a dozen people with ALS in the course of doing the research for this story. And eight of the 12 died before I finished the final draft. And so these are people who only have so much time left. And I realize that's true for all of us, but folks with ALS really have the clock ticking right in front of them. And that these people would say, okay, with some of that limited time, I'm going to spend it with you, Lisa. Like, oh my God, that is it's beyond humbling and, and such a privileged and, and we're not, 
beating around the bush. So with all of the books, all of the, all of the relationships I have with the folks who are willing to share with me what's going on, these conversations aren't like, Hey, how are you? Good. Good. How's it going? Good. Like, no, like we are delving into, you know, have you lived a meaningful life? What do you want your legacy to be? What are you afraid of? Um, it's about, it's, it's about love and intimacy and connection. And so these relationships become very personal and very real quickly. And I always learn big lessons about how to live from people who are facing these kinds of crises. Um, so yeah, I learn about, you know, like love Anthony was about autism and betrayal And I chose those two to go side by side because it was about how do we love unconditionally? So, you know, if you have severe autism and you can't speak and you don't like to make eye contact and you don't want to be touched, so you can't say I love you and you don't want to hug and you can't exchange all the magic that can be exchanged through eye contact, can you still experience meaningful love? And the answer is yes, because love is energy. And there are ways to do that, that are beyond the sort of the normal routes that we take to express and feel love. But that it's harder. And it's not obvious right away to especially people who aren't familiar with autism, and they see a child flapping his hands and not making eye contact and not speaking. How do you reach that child? Um, and similarly, if, if someone betrays you, can you still love that person? So it's the idea in that book is, well, it's easy to love when it's easy to love, but what happens when it's difficult? Can you still love then? And how can you expand your ability to love? So in doing the research for that book and in writing that story, my God, did my ability to love expand. So I'm, I feel very lucky to every book I write, I, I become a little better. Wow. That's, it's, it's so beautiful. And it's, you bring humanity to everything that you're talking about and just a better understanding and, um, and such grace, even, I don't know, just listening to it just brings a sense of, um, peace and a better understanding and expansion, just listening to you. You've been so generous with your time. I have one final question. Um, What are the three best pieces of advice you can offer the women listening today based on your own life experience? Three key takeaways that can help them on their own path. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, One that I love is it doesn't all have to come from you. So I think a lot of women, because we face it, we are so capable, I think, especially compared to our other gender counterpart. <laughs> um, so we can, we can do it all, but it doesn't all have to come from you. So, you know, give yourself a break and some space to take care of yourself or to pursue a passion or to spend time with friends. Like, so, you know, you can hire a babysitter or you don't have to bake the, the cookies or like, I don't know, like give your, or you don't have to fly to Washington DC to give the keynote. Like you don't have to do it all. It doesn't all have to come from you. So someone else will give the keynote in a couple of weeks and it will be wonderful. It didn't have to come from me this year. So likewise, like I don't have to, you know, be at every single thing of my kids. Sometimes I have to be at a keynote. So, um, it doesn't all have to come from you. Um, I think that listen to the, when you, I think everything boils down to either love or fear. So listen to the voice in you when it, and notice when it comes, if it's coming from fear or if it's coming from love and that will help steer you. And then the other one is, um, you're going to be dead someday. Do it now. Uh, amazing. You're amazing. I, I can't, <laughs> no, you are, Lisa. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation more than, oh, I mean, really you. enjoyed it. And you I too. just want to acknowledge you and your work. And I think everyone should read all of your books. Um, I, they're, I mean, they're just so beautifully written. And again, just the fact that you're connecting 
the truth of what's happening with these people with the empathy piece. It's just, it's so, it's so great and needs to be out there more. And I'm going to, I'll list, um, uh, the books on the show notes so people can go find you, but where, where can people learn more about you? Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Um, so you can find out more about me at lisagenova.com. Okay. That's perfect. But I'm going to link your TED Talks too. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, because those are great. Um, you've been very generous with your time. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your time today. You've been amazing. And, thank um, you we, so much, Michelle. This has been such a pleasure. I oh, appreciate you giving me an opportunity to reach people through your podcast. Oh, great. I'm so, I'm so grateful to be able to do that. And um, yeah, I wish you the most success in everything you do, which it will be. So um, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you too. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. I'd love to hear what resonated with you. So come on over to the goodlifecoach.com podcast page. While you're there, you can look at all the show notes from today's episode and join my newsletter. As a thank you, you'll receive the first chapter of my book for free. Thanks so much for listening and bye for now.